When I was born, my dad was out in the little waiting room and he saw them pull the sheet over Irene's face. So he thought Irene had died. Well, then he sees the doctor pass out on the floor. He thought his wife is dead, the doctor passed out. So my God, what happened? My grandmother belonged to this church that was very spiritual, spirit-filled, like a holy roller type of church. This is the story Irene told me. They were coming over to visit, and just before Irene even got into her mother's door, Grandma came out, grabbed me out of her hands, took me into the front room, and laid me like in this circle of women. And they were saying, my grandmother says, give us this child of Satan, this devil child, that's what they called me. And they were praying in tongues and, you know, deliver her. And Irene had this child and they were praying for her because she had sex with the devil. And they didn't mean my dad, they meant a devil. And this was the result, was me. There was no medical reason that they found that I was born this way. And Irene swears up and down she never took anything. And she never was a person that she never drank, she never did drugs. They figured there was nothing else because I didn't have any other anomalies. With the lidomide, they had like little flippers, visual problems or uh, mental retardation, all kinds of stuff with that. But because I didn't have anything else, they just assumed it was just some fluke. Irene, that's my mother, we never had a good relationship at all. She was almost taught from the very beginning that this child is not something to love, it's something to, to fear. I was the firstborn, and you put a lot of hopes and dreams in your firstborn. Well, when your firstborn comes out with no arms and legs, that does something to a parent, I'm sure. She resented me for everything because she was stuck with this disabled child. So I grew up with a lot of medical problems because she ignored my health a lot. I couldn't go to the bathroom when I wanted because she wouldn't want to take me. I would have to wait for my sister who would or my dad. So I had loads of medical problems because of that. She told my dad that because of her back, she couldn't take care of me anymore. And this is a woman who bowled on a tournament. <laughs> when they sent me to Rancho, the excuse they used, because they couldn't put on their chart that I was being dumped, you know, by a parent. This is a rehab hospital. So what it is on the chart, it says that I was sent there in order to get artificial legs that would enable me to walk. Even though I was a fairly independent person, you know, I could do a great deal on my own, but because you live at home and you have a sister that'll help you and a father that'll help you, you don't do as much as you could on your own. The real true meaning of independence, you know, it's really trying to do as much as you can without the help of others. My goal was I was going to get out and have an apartment of my own, but that didn't happen a lot back then in the early 60s. It just wasn't happening. Most people with disabilities either lived at home or lived in a nursing home or stayed at Rancho. I've known Diane for like over 30 years. I think, let's say, when we met was like 1973. And I was a graduate student at UCLA and Diane was an undergraduate student there. My question was how the, how was she going to compete in the environment of UCLA? She has a remarkable quality that I noticed vis-a-vis -vis the other so-called handicapped students. The other handicapped students were easily broken, but with her, she was undaunted. Not only did she get her degree from the University of California, but she also got a master's degree from USC in social work. It was frightening to me and the disability and yeah. I didn't know exactly how you were going to survive this. Lots of people, especially people with disabilities, think of themselves, poor me, look what happened to me. And I don't think I've ever felt like a victim except when I was Jim's victim. 
Jim was always my attendant as well as my husband, which I always hated. I thought that was the worst thing we could have done for our relationship because it takes something out of it, you know. But he never wanted me to have an attendant. He wanted that money, that extra money. He wanted to feel needed. And because he knew he, because of Vietnam and his drinking, he could never go out and get a job. He knew that. So he felt that he was at least providing some sort of service, I guess, by taking care of me. But when he'd get drunk, that's what he would lay in on, on all the time. He said, oh, I have to wipe your, you know, and do this. And he would make me feel like, you know, tiny, tiny. He got really, really violent one night. And he just went nuts and he was hitting me and the furniture was thrown all over the place. And it was just bizarre that you came at that time. And you came and you you got me out of there. That's right. I remember I go, stay the... Put a hand on her and... It was really scary at times. It was awful. And we departed. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you can see. <laughs> you uh. No, I was not one of those women that was drawn to that kind of relationship. Never. And all my other relationships have been, you know, good. Interesting. Not very long term, <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, but no, Jim's was the only abusive one. If you don't receive love and if you don't receive support or encouragement or any of that, then yeah, you could become a victim very easily. And I did not receive that then, but yet I didn't become a victim. And so I'm sure my dad played a great deal you know, in that, in helping me know that I am better than that, that I am strong, that I can, you know, accomplish things. And Rancho did too. I don't like the word deformed. I hate that word. People relate to you by how you look. That's the truth. Studies have shown that good-looking children get more attention in school. Good-looking people get further ahead in life. That's just the way our culture is. So when you're disabled and your physical image doesn't quite fit in, then you have to somehow reconcile that with who you see you are. People can't imagine why I can be so comfortable in my body. But to me, because I have somewhere along the line just accepted and felt fine with it, it never has bothered me. My self-image, my image that I portray to others, if you don't like it, well, then that's your problem. Get it. Come here. Good job. I like a very artistic soul and um, someone who um, can see beyond the flesh, which, you know, that doesn't happen too often. But I like that. But I like a good look at one too. <laughs> so I look at body, too. Absolutely. When you meet somebody, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. I, I mean, unfortunately, if I was to meet somebody, they go, oh, what a wonderful spirit she has. I want to be with you. But they don't. They look at you and say, oh, she's got nice eyes, but she's got no arms and legs. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all here really as lessons to each other. I think we all have something to teach one another. I believe that. Maybe my purpose was to help people understand and to see that just because you look different, you're not necessarily different. <laughs> I saw her light more than her body. And I had a stepmom who spent three years in Auschwitz. And so her light was so strong that people in her presence would immediately go into tears. Diane's been a guide to me primarily. She's a teacher and she showed me something. She says, you know, you're more involved with my disabilities than my strength. We are not our disabilities. We have the same hopes, dreams, desires. We get angry. We're not angels like some people think we are. You know, we're not super smart. There's some dumb ones. We're just like you guys, except 
we have to learn to maneuver about our world in a more creative manner. Hardly ever do I go anywhere, like this luncheon I just went to. I met several women there, and they were all very nice. But they all addressed how I drive my wheelchair, how lovely I am for someone with no arms and legs, all that kind of stuff. They never once asked me, like they're asking each other, so what do you do? No one asked me that. They just assume I'm in a wheelchair, so I don't do anything. <laughs> I was waiting for the train in Long Beach on the platform, and this guy came up to me, and he says, "Well, so then, how do you, uh, like, how do you pee and have sex?" I swear he said that, and I looked at him, and I says, "Why don't you first tell me how you do it?" You know, I can walk down the street, and people do this all the time to me. Come right up to my face and say, "Ooh, what happened to you?" Most times, I let that go. It's not worth it. That's just their curiosity, and if they're an adult, their ignorance. And they will say to me, oh my God, you are so incredible. Now, what I think they think, because they don't know me, they don't know what kind of attitude I have, they just see me. And I think in their mind, they are saying, if I had no arms and legs, I would not be out here running around like you are and letting people see you. You guys get up and get dressed and do what you need to do. We get up and get dressed with the help of a person that we have to tell what we need and how to do it so they won't feel offended. So we've had to learn all these skills. Imagine if your very existence depended upon other people being there for you in a physical way. I help her with her personal care, you know, getting her dressed, doing her hair and makeup and shower and do her laundry, vacuum, just a lot of domestic stuff. But with Diana, I really don't have to help her that much. You know, I drive for her, but she also goes shopping on her own. She'll get in her chair and go. We hit it off. Diana and I hit it off really well. She's great. Um, we're not too far apart in age, so we have a lot of the same interests. She's practiced her profession as a therapist for many years. Sometimes her health prevents her from working. I was going along quite well in my work until I got sick. They didn't know what was wrong with me. I was falling asleep at work and I was in and out of the hospital. I'd come home and two days later I was back in. But my doctor said I could not go back to work. My leg down here was very, very, very red and tender. And they said, you know, maybe we just need to go in there and look. So he went in and cut out this little thing. And this little thing, I'm laying there in the recovery room and my primary physician, she comes over to me and, wake up, wake up, we found your leg, but your foot. And I'm like, you know, out of it. And I said, what? We found your foot, look, look. And she's showing me these Polaroids. We took it to pathology and pathology seems to think it was an embryotic foot. Yes, Ms. Salazar, this is Diane DeVries. If you could hold on a minute, I'm gonna put you on speaker. Thank you. Diane is having a difficult time finding a job around here. I know that she's looked. It just doesn't seem like anything's clicking right now. Can't find social work out here. It's been impossible. I was just wondering if you received my resume yet? And how long will it be before I hear anything? Juggling the finances where the attendance, the state, gives her money, but if she works, then they mess with her funds. If I had to go back into a nursing home, I don't, I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. It's like death. You get in there, there's no reason to live. You see death all around you. But I would do anything I could not to go back into a nursing home. I just can't even imagine it. Yeah, it would be going back to everything I tried to overcome when I decided to go to graduate school. I knew it would be hard work. And I knew, I knew I could do it, but I knew it would be hard work. And so I had to tell myself, besides wanting to be a social worker, there had to be something else that would motivate me. So my motivation was 
to get off of government, to have my own home. That's what I was going to work for. That's what I wanted. This is not where I should be. <clears throat> right, I should have been already in my own home. I should be off of government assistance. I should have more of a fulfilled life working somewhere where I'd be working with people and and maybe, uh, you know, I always kind of wanted to um, have my own clinic. I wanted a combination. I wanted, I wanted a really nice hospice um, for terminally ill that they could come and stay and live and it would be really nice and, and there would be all kinds of services offered and then the other half of it would be a rehab center helping people get independent, become independent. That was always my dream, to have that and direct it. Uh, so um, that was, so, you know, none of that happened. I don't know anybody who's had ups and downs like she has had. <laughs> no. She's just going to keep pursuing it until she finds something. I know she will. So, okay, I found a different avenue now. Grant writing. Grant writing with CST, I like it because I enjoy writing. And I'm doing a good thing, helping them raise, get money for service dogs. This one is a very isolated job. I'm very alone here. She would like to have some companionship, I think, in her life. Male companionship, besides just me, her attendant. As far as being archetypical beauty, who is a female sex object, she doesn't fit that type. Although she has not been without men in her life. I've never been the kind of person like being picked up on a bar, because that doesn't happen when you look like me. The person has to know you. So like my friends will know what I'm like and they'll tell this guy and if they're a decent guy, that just doesn't phase them. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, well, I think Marvin was the last time. So that was been, um, I've lived here three years. About six, big year. Six years since I've had sex. My girlfriend, should I tell you what she bought me the other day? She's in a wheelchair, she has polio. We're very good friends. So she comes over with this beautiful little gift bag and she says, I got you something. I says, oh, how nice. So she goes over and closes the bedroom door because Rhonda was here. I said, why are you closing the door? She says, because it's just a present for you. She says, I affectionately call it Mr. Pink. So she opens it and it's a dildo. And I said, I don't believe you. And she says, well, you know, you, you need it. You have to have it. You, you know, you're a sexual person. I said, now, you gonna explain to me how I'm gonna do this? <laughs> <laughs> Diane's been through a lot in her life, but she has succeeded. I mean, she's done so much. She said that she was here to show people how lucky they are. She was sent here for a purpose. She's very clear about her mission here on Earth. I mean, if this film could do anything, that's what I would want it to do, to show that there's so much more to a person than just their disability. How many people do we know that are clear about why they're here?